guys, I'm Tark Maryface and welcome to this video on Maryface Aviation. This is a quick video to answer a question I found on the forum. The question was, what would happen if you were to sit on the wing of an airplane? I really like it because there are quite a few points that come into this. The first one is the relative airflow. If you were to sit on an airplane, let's say a 737 that's cruising at 30,000 feet, they'll be cruising at about 400 knots through airspeed. At those speeds, that's about 140, 60 miles per hour, the force from the drag of the air hitting you would be so strong that you wouldn't even be able to hold on, even if you had a pair of handy well, handles. So you wouldn't be able to hold on. You'd probably fly off within seconds. So now you're thinking, well, okay, what about if I strap myself in? What about then? Sorry, there are a couple of other things to take into account. The first one is temperature. At 30,000 feet, the standard atmospheric temperature is of minus 45 degrees Celsius. In fact, the only place that gets around those temperatures are mountains like Mount Everest the tall ones, the, at the very top of them. And that's only because they're at about those heights. But not only that, we're actually traveling very fast through the air. And if you ever use a fan, you know that when air's blowing your way, you get colder. And that's called the wind chill factor. 30,000 feet, where the environment is minus 45 degrees Celsius, and you're traveling at 460 miles per hour, you would feel a wind chill factor of minus 99.3 degrees Celsius. That is extremely cold. Not even the best best mountaineering equipment out there is rated for someone to be able to survive in those kinds of temperatures. You would die within minutes. Okay, but now let's assume that we do have the technology. Okay, so we're strapped in and we've got our nice blankets and coats and stuff to be able to survive the frigid temperatures at minus 30,000, sorry, at 30,000 feet. I talk anymore. What about then? Are you safe? No, you're still not safe, I'm afraid to say, because now we have to talk about density. You see, air density actually decreases as we climb into the atmosphere. For those of you who don't know what density is, density is simply the amount of air within a certain volume. So let's say we got a cube about this big, one meter by one meter by one meter, and we count the amount of molecules in there, that would give us the air density. The amount of stuff in it, the proportions of it, doesn't change. You always get 21% of the air being oxygen, but as you climb, there'll be less of it. Now that's a problem because as you breathe the air, there won't be enough of it going into the lungs, into the blood, and around your body, especially your brain. At 30,000 feet, you would lose consciousness within one to three minutes. Shortly after, you would suffer brain damage. Later on, you would die. So now I can hear you guys saying, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. If it's so dangerous, how do we survive those altitudes when we're in the plane? And then there's another question I'm sure you've got that I'll answer later. The first one, how do we survive in the plane if it's such a dangerous environment? Well, the airplane does something that's very clever. It takes air that's going into the engine and rams it into the cabin. That's right, the air that you breathe in the cabin is air that was taken from the engine. Now that air is rammed into the cabin and it increases the air density by increasing the air pressure. Now to make sure that things don't get too intense, too rammed, there is an outflow valve that controls, sorry, outflow valve that controls how much air actually leaves the airplane. Now planes are pressurized to, for eight to 10,000 feet. What does that mean? That simply means that the pressure inside the aircraft is equivalent to the pressure you would find at eight to 10,000 feet. And that is to say, the same density that you would find at eight to 10,000 feet. Why do we not make it to sea level? It's simply a question of economics and technology. It would be far too expensive and too difficult to make an efficient aircraft that would be pressurized at sea level. You see, there's a huge amount of strain on the aircraft because of the differential pressure, that is to say, the difference between the pressure inside the plane and outside the plane. At eight to 10,000 feet, there is virtually no effect on your body and it's, not, it's easier on the airplane. There's less stuff going on and less likelihood of the plane to break, which is a good thing. Okay, now the second question I can hear you asking was, hold on, earlier on you said that, you know, people climb Mount Everest and Mount Everest is about the same altitude. So how come they're okay? I'm pretty sure it takes more than one to three minutes to go to the top of Mount Everest and come back down. And you're right. However, there's something that people do before climbing Mount Everest. It's called acclimatization, and I can't say it right, I'm sorry. What they'll do is they'll climb to a very high base. It's called a base camp, and they'll stay there for a little while, and then when they're ready, they'll go up to a higher camp, spend the night there, come back down, and then a higher camp, spend the night, and come back down, and so on, and so on. And what they're doing is they're getting their bodies to get used to the altitude. You see, when we're going higher up, we don't have enough oxygen in the body. So what the body does is it creates hemoglobin. 
Hemoglobin are the cells that carry oxygen around your body and into your brain and into your muscles and into your organs and into everything that needs oxygen. This process takes a very long time and it's actually very painful because there are loads of side effects. It can even be deadly if not done properly. People who are not properly acclimatized, that's it, can die when they climb high altitudes far too quickly. And it's not pleasant. You've got migraines, dehydration, and all kinds of other nasty stuff. And even then, even when they've prepared their body for that long, people climbing Mount Everest have to go beyond a point that's called the death zone. The death zone is a certain altitude above which you can only survive for 16 hours. That's right. That means that after that point, the people got 16 hours to go to the summit of Everest, take their victory picture, and then come back down below the limb. Otherwise, they will die. In fact, people that climb Mount Everest at the end they use oxygen tanks, otherwise that death zone would be a lot shorter than 16 hours. It would be something around 8 to 6 hours or something like that, depending on the person. So even without all that preparation, it's still extremely dangerous to expose yourself to those kinds of environments. There are only a few people in the world who have ever achieved the task of climbing Mount Everest without oxygen and coming back down safely. Many have tried and many have perished. Well, that's it for the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any more questions, feel free to ask in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe and check out my other videos. And I'll see you guys next time. I'm Tarek Merryface and happy flying.